Assalamu alaikum khawateen hostat. Wasim Hassan welcomes you to Marketing for Non-Profit Organizations, MKT 628 at the Virtual University of Pakistan. The topic at hand today is what differentiates NPOs from commercial organizations. We know that there is a big difference between the two sectors. And until the time we understand the differences, we just cannot go ahead with applicability of marketing principles with adaptations to the sector of NPOs. And therefore, the two objectives which naturally flow out of the topic are, number one, what really is it that classifies NPOs into the class they belong? And what are the unique managerial insights needed to manage NPOs? And number two objective is, what is so unique about NPO marketing? And like I said, these two objectives are the very interrelated and intertwined and therefore the narrative which I'm going to give you in relation to the topic is going to answer uh, all the questions about these two objectives. We know that NPOs are different from uh, the commercial organizations because uh, NPOs are basically all about fulfilling a certain social cause. They exist to serve a certain purpose and around that purpose they try to achieve the mission. And the mission, of course, embodies that particular purpose. There are so many different causes for which NPOs exist, and they follow different kinds of missions. They are quite very different from commercial marketers, because commercial marketers operate in areas which are known to so many different stakeholders within the different industries commercial marketers operate in. If they operate in the car manufacturing industry, they understand the dynamics behind marketing of uh, cars. If they the operate you know, within the detergents industry, they understand the dynamics. But when it comes to NPOs, it is a different ball game altogether. You have a very specialized kind of a purpose that you serve, and you have a very special mission that fulfills that purpose. To achieve that mission, therefore, you have to have a very special kind of a marketing program which is quite very different in nature from the one you may have for the commercial sector. Another reason uh, for um, the differences between NPOs and commercial organizations is that NPOs have to depend quite a lot on outside support in the form of donations, grants, and contributions. Donations from individuals, associations, the foundations, etc., etc. Grants from the governments, governmental agencies, and contributions from the private sector. I would like to take you back to the narrative which I gave you earlier, and which is all about cost marketing. Cost marketing is engagement of the private sector with the NPOs on fulfillment of a certain cost. So that is how you generate contributions from the private sector. This is a subject which I'm going to cover as a separate topic later. However, the fact remains that uh, the outside support mechanism that makes it absolutely essential for NPOs to have a character which is basically different from that of the commercial organizations. Having uh, given you this uh, brief overview, I would now like to talk about uh, the factors which really are responsible for the differentiation between NPOs and commercial organizations. The first factor uh, which uh, uh, is responsible for the primary difference is what you may call the donation-seeking role of NPOs, or in the words of uh, a marketing expert, the donative nature of 
organizations. As the terminology implies, organizations look for funds from the sources which I just talked about as part of the overview. As a result of that, donors develop stakes in the organizations and they start interfering and intervening into the operations. Even if they have a complete uh, harmony of views on the purpose and the mission of the organization, the divergence of views on the way operations are going to be executed causes a divide between strategies and their executions. This is a situation which uh, generally uh, puts NPO managers uh, into a state of uh, the frustration. They get disappointed because they think in all uh, professional right and wisdom, they should be the ones to execute the strategies uh, which already have been agreed upon. And as a matter of fact, it was uh, on the basis of those strategies that they approached the donors who agreed to donate funds to the organization. Once they have done that, there is no point on their part to be intervening when it comes to execution of uh, the strategies. The fact remains they do. For the simple reason that uh, profitability is not an issue uh, in uh, NPOs. It is the achievement of the mission. And we also know that uh, achievement of the mission may take a very long time. It could be years. And therefore what happens is that donors and board of directors involve themselves in order to assess and gauge the performance that is taking place during different phases of the operations. This involvement is something with which it may be considered as interference on part of managers. It has been seen that uh, donors could have been cited interfering to the point of suggesting staff recruitments and appointment of advertising agencies. Now, like I said, in all uh, the professional right and uh, wisdom, this should be the domain of professional managers and not the donors. But the fact remains, they do interfere, causing, like I said, a divide between policy guidelines, strategies which flow out of those policy guidelines and execution. Donors think they are playing a very positive role, whereas managers think the role is less than positive. However, without going into who is right in that kind of a hypothetical situation and who's not, donors have been seen interfering to the point of telling marketing managers which segments of the market to approach first. In other words, they've been telling whether they should go and approach urban market first and give it precedence over the rural market or vice versa. Now, this is kind of a decision which is typically that of marketing managers and not donors. But that's the way it's been happening in the sector of NPOs. It does happen and it may still happen. So what happens is that managers within NPOs could have to deal not only with customers for the delivery of the effective service, they also have to deal with donors all the time because of their interference and intervention. This is something which does not happen in the uh, commercial sector. Now, this is not to say that uh, commercial managers do not really have to deal with uh, members of the board or uh, top management in order to take them on board in terms of execution of the strategies which have been decided upon. But in the NPO sector, things are a little different because uh, managers could have to generate funds from the uh, donors and uh, that support mechanism could makes it a little more difficult and more challenging for the NPO managers to execute their marketing programs. Let me explain um, the, the whole situation with the help of uh, the graphics, which is uh, going to make um, my narrative a little uh, more interesting. As you can see from the presentation, I'm showing the two sectors. The one is for-profit, other one is non-profit. A for-profit sector has uh, the two activities. The one is strategies and programs, and this is what is done at the highest level, uh, which includes, of course, the, the marketing manager and the product and brand managers. The second level is where they deal with customers, and this is a manifestation of the area of external marketing. This is where all the variables of marketing mix come into play, and uh, managers are in a position to get the desired results. 
and this is where they fulfill their overall business goals and objectives. As long as uh, the organization is uh, in the profitability zone, everything is fine, everybody's happy. As long as uh, they have the right uh, the financial ratios and uh, earning per share, et cetera, et cetera, there is nothing wrong with the performance measures or success parameters as far as uh, commercial organizations are concerned. This is not the case for the nonprofit sector. As you can see, first of all, they have to deal with uh, the donors. They also gonna have to do a lot of working on the strategy side. And as a matter of fact, they work, first of all, on strategies, which is the middle box uh, on this side of the graphics. And after having worked on the strategies, which are a reflection of uh, uh, the policy guidelines given by the members of the board, they go to donors to seek their support because they have to convince the donors about the purpose and the mission of the organization and then strategies which they have put into place to be able to serve the purpose and achieve the mission. But then donors keep coming back and that is where uh, intervention takes place. The kind of inter intervention I was talking about and this is where marketing sovereignty gets compromised. And this is what marketing managers or marketing staff members do not really like and prefer. And then they also have to deal with customers in order to deliver the service or the program for which they are working. Needless to say that they can mostly work on the social welfare side. I mean, there are situations in which they deal with the selling products and services like hospitals and the dispensaries, but the ultimate objective is the mission they work for, and that is social welfare. So as you can see, uh, this is uh, the more, a little more convoluted and has the one additional layer in comparison with the for-profit area. And uh, this is uh, what makes the job of marketing managers a little more challenging. Because of this challenge, the NPOs are different uh, for, from the commercial organizations. The second uh, factor uh, which uh, causes uh, the differentiation between NPOs and uh, commercial organizations is the factor of public scrutiny. The fact is that this factor is an extension of the one I just talked about. Again, because of the support mechanism um, on which NPOs could have to depend a lot, uh, they look up to the donors and donors keep coming back and back over and over again. Here, again, they involve themselves in order to assess and gauge performance of management during different phases. The, the members of the board could also involve themselves a lot just in order to do what donors also do. So the organizations get under a very high level of scrutiny. Now, this is not to say that this is something negative. This certainly has a very positive side to it because of the fact that it takes a very long time for the mission to be completed. Uh, managers could have to undergo a lot of stress during different stages of the implementation program. And the fact is that when donors and uh, board members involve themselves, it is not really intervention, it is involvement. So from the positive standpoint, we should be looking at the whole thing as involvement and engagement and not interference and intervention. When we look at the whole thing from that standpoint, we realize that managers get a lot of support from uh, the board members and donors. Again, needless to say, the donors and board members are the people with a lot of socio-political clout in most of the cases. And therefore, they are the ones who really help NPOs achieve many of the objectives and help them overcome many of the hurdles and stumbling blocks which they may find while they deal with different agencies especially governmental agencies. Because of the red tape and because of the procedural rigmarole, the managers from the NPOs could have to go through with all those layers of the red tapeism. And board members and donors come to their rescue and help. So from that standpoint, it is a very positive thing that happens. And it also takes a lot of uh, responsibility and encumbrance uh, uh, from the managers who are not 
solely held responsible for the outcome because the board members and donors keep engaged throughout the whole process of implementation. This is where the importance of uh, the developing good relations with the board members and donors uh, come in. As uh, the part of uh, the one topic, uh, I did talk about the necessity uh, for uh, uh, developing uh, the very good working relationships uh, uh, with the, the donors and the board members because it is helpful for uh, the organizations. Therefore, it is a great challenge for the management of NPOs, in particular the marketing management of NPOs, to develop good working relationships with the donors and board members. This brings in a lot of transparency and this brings in a lot of confidence and support to the working managers. The third factor, which again is extremely important as the preceding two I've just talked about, is the level of desirability of marketing. What this reflects is a negative thinking on part of uh, the board members and uh, the donors that uh, the applicability of marketing is not really as essential in the NPO sector as it is generally portrayed. This is a very uh, myopic kind of an approach which uh, can hurt NPOs and not help them at all. If they think that uh, the marketing is not essential only because it incurs a lot of expenditure, then they are at a loss to understand the benefits with which applicability of marketing brings to NPOs. This uh, the kind of negative thinking is on the wane nowadays, but still there are skeptics who think that uh, the marketing is not really needed. What really are the reasons with which uh, dissuade these people from uh, the believing that uh, the marketing is absolutely essential and it should occupy a very central role in the overall management of NPOs. There are two factors. One is um, that marketing is all about advertising and promotion. The second factor is that of marketing research which they find very intrusive. Now let me explain these two the sub factors of uh, the desirability of marketing factor. Um, number one Marketing is all about advertising and promotions is a very short-sighted approach because these people do not seem to have a grounding in marketing. Even if they do not have a solid grounding in the area of marketing, they should be able to understand and appreciate that applicability of marketing in its entirety, in its composite form, is what an organization really looks for and what an organization really needs. Just looking at advertising and promotion is a very myopic approach. It presents marketing in a very truncated form. It is just one ingredient in the overall recipe that we use to apply principles of marketing. Because we are just talking about advertising and promotion. We're not talking about the total offering. We have to talk about different programs for which we exist. We have different purposes, I mean different organizations uh, have different purposes to serve and therefore different missions to follow. And whatever is the purpose and the mission of the organization that has to be presented to all the stakeholders in a well-packaged form. Just like on the commercial side, you come up with a product which looks very attractive and then you price it in a very friendly way that consumers are attracted and then you distribute the product in a way that the customers find it convenient to go and buy it and then you promote that product in order to persuade and convince your customers that that is the right product and they should buy it in preference over competitors' products. But that's not the case in NPOs. It may be the case that when NPOs are operating in a very competitive environment and there are so many different NPOs working with the same purpose, but the fact remains that the product or the offering or the marketing program that they are working on has to be presented to all the stakeholders in a very composite form um, as a well-packaged offering or a well-packaged product. At the same time, they have got to be very sensitive about the distribution of that product. For example, if you were part of a blood bank, would you expect all the people to come to you to donate blood or would you like to have different uh, units 
in different parts of the city where people find it convenient to go and give blood. I think you'll go for the latter because that amounts to having good distribution. And by the same token, when you are pursuing your customers in terms of advertising and promotion, you have so many different tools whereby you try to convince your customers it is not just the advertising, there are so many different tools which you bring into play in order to come up with a mix of the variables or a mix of total composite recipe which you need to be able to effectively execute your programs. Coming to the next point, which is about marketing research, these uh, detractors or opponents of uh, the marketing research think that uh, it is expensive. So again, it incurs a lot of um, expenditure. And this is something which uh, the marketing managers already know, or they should know. And then they also seem to think that uh, the market research is very intrusive in nature especially in the context of uh, the social welfare. Uh, the market researchers could go to rural areas could asking poor, simple village folks about their lifestyles, their habits, their preferences, and their social values. There are so many social issues could, which are sensitive, and therefore those people are uh, not in a position to give the right answers. And in most of the cases, they give erroneous answers. And because of those erroneous answers, the research findings are not as accurate as they should be. Well, there is an answer to that, and uh, the marketing managers they do have at their disposal uh, certain tools to which they apply in order to extract the right information. And they also have a way to convince the people that they are there in order to alleviate their sufferings and not to add to their problems. Whereas uh, people might think that uh, the research which is being carried out uh, might add to their problems and uh, give them uh, reasons to be superstitious and suspicious. The next factor is that of uh, the volunteers. As you might know, NPOs could find it uh, much less expensive to go for uh, the volunteers who are willing to work for NPOs. NPOs do not incur extra cost by having volunteers to work for them. Even if there are certain costs involved, those are minimal. And given the fact that uh, the NPOs could have to uh, look uh, outwards in order to get financial support, they have a tendency to go for volunteers. The fact is that uh, in the Western markets, there is a, a tendency nowadays on part of the youth to be involved with different NPOs. And that uh, provides them with uh, very good working experience in the first place. And in the second place, it provides them to place something positive on the CVs. This is something which I talked about earlier as part of the building blocks for the overall course. The point here is that it works both ways. The youth are attracted toward the NPOs to gain certain experience and talk about something positive on the CVs. And NPOs find it attractive because they do not really have to incur additional costs in a big way. However, there's a challenge involved here, and uh, the challenge is all about the working. Volunteers who work for NPOs are not really trained to work for the programs NPOs are executing. So in the first place, NPOs could have to bring all those people into the mainstream of their operations by giving them orientation. Not all the volunteers are highly disciplined people with professional orientation. And therefore, it becomes quite very challenging for the managers to integrate their working into theirs, thereby causing the certain problems. Second, the volunteers they may not be the very highly disciplined people, even if they have the tendency to learn and apply what has been imparted as part of the orientation, if they lack discipline, they always will cause problems for the organization. So this is another challenge which NPOs could have to come to grips with uh, while they operate. They do not have the luxury of applying carrot and stick approach which they generally do while dealing with the paid staff. Since volunteers are not paid, this approach also does not work. So the challenge for managers remain to integrate these uh, volunteers into the mainstream of their operations. The next factor which differentiates NPOs is uh, that of uh, the nature of exchange. 
Now, this is something which is the essence of the whole course and uh, the many of uh, the concepts that uh, I'm going to talk about and we all are going to learn um, are going to revolve around the value of exchange. Uh, what is an exchange in the first place? Well, all I can say is that uh, the, the whole marketing is all about exchanges. You pay an amount of money in order to get something in return of economic benefit. And that something comes to you in the form of a product or a service. So the economic benefit which you get out of the exchange is the satisfaction of your need through that particular product or service. The question is, is this the case with NPOs? The answer is, it is not. The nature of exchange with NPOs is very different. So what is it that you ask your customers for? You do ask your customers for a price, and for them, it is a cost. But the cost may not be money all the time. It comes to the customers in so many different ways. You ask your customers to sacrifice something in return for something good. This is the essence of the purpose of NPOs. And what is that good? That good is all about social welfare. Either you change your behavior in order to be the better citizens, or you change your behavior in order to help the society at large. Whatever you do, it is beneficial in social terms. And the question here is, what is the price you ask for? Well, the price you ask for um, in return for something good uh, is sacrifices of different kinds. And there are four different kinds of sacrifices which consumers or your target audience uh, have to give in order to get something good in return. Number one is the economic sacrifice. This is the amount of money that you pay to a charity or the money you pay to buy a product or a service from a charitable organization. And the economic benefit you get in return is, you know, the good health or prevention of an ailment and so on and so forth. So this is an economic benefit which is very similar to that of uh, the one you get on the commercial side. The other sacrifice uh, that uh, your consumers give is uh, that of uh, the value system. In other words, they have uh, the certain values which they harbor and uh, are not really willing to change. Whereas you as marketing managers could have the challenge to change those values because you think those are kind of negative values or not very highly positive. And therefore, you must be the ones to inculcate some positive values into your consumers by having them change the old values. For example, uh, they may have uh, a value that uh, a large size of the family is uh, always good. Whereas you may think, or rather you do think, that uh, the small size of the family is better than a large size of the family. So that you're out there trying to change that value, convincing the, your target audience that they should have a smaller family and not a larger family as part of your family planning program. Uh, the other value with which your uh, consumers could, may um, really subscribe to is women could, should not work or could, women should not get into business. Could, whereas could, you might try to convince them there is nothing wrong with women either working in organizations or becoming small entrepreneurs. Therefore, could, what is um, happening is because you're trying to change the whole value system. So in other words, the price they have to pay is the sacrifice of old values in place of uh, new adopted values which are beneficial for them. So this is the benefit they are going to get in return for an exchange of old values with the new ones. The third kind of sacrifice is uh, saying goodbye to set uh, behavioral patterns and attitudes. Uh, for example, the driving badly on the roads or smoking, for example, or uh, uh, taking drugs. You have to convince your target audience that, uh, that they have to change their behavior and attitude toward the actions they are taking because those are not beneficial for them. You may have to convince them to quit smoking, uh, to be a better driver or uh, not use drugs, etc. These are the kind of established behaviors which are to be changed and uh, 
the sacrifice with which people have to give is the established behaviors. They have established behaviors because they get certain benefits out of those and they have to be convinced that the benefits they think are good ones are not the ones that they should look for. There are other benefits too and by exchanging the old the patterns of for the set behaviors and adopting the new ones, they will be better off. This is a challenge for the non-profit managers and a sacrifice which may be perceived on part of the target audience. The fourth kind of sacrifice is about time and energy. Uh, let's go back uh, to the factor of uh, the volunteers and uh, they will know that uh, the people have to give time to which again is money and uh, they have to uh, spend uh, the energy in order to uh, work for a certain organization. Uh, likewise, uh, we have uh, the ad hoc uh, the directors and uh, they also uh, spend a lot of time and energy when it comes to uh, the working for an NPO. Um, so this is a case of uh, the sacrificing time and energy. Under these uh, the circumstances and uh, in relation to this particular factor, uh, we also have to look at the benefits which uh, the people think they derive by changing their behavior. While they go for the exchange, uh, what is it that really uh, motivates them to uh, change their behavior? Well, the benefits uh, that could uh, come to them in so many different forms of which three or four are very important. They, they might perceive kind of psychological benefits. They, they might think that the benefit uh, is in the form of bring something good to the society, which is basically their social responsibility. And uh, because of being wealthy, they have to do something uh, for the society at large. And uh, the uh, benefit could also be perceived as a religious obligation. Marketing managers could have to be smart and uh, very uh, analytical when it comes to pinpointing the kind of benefits which target audience things they are getting out of the exchange because by um, differentiating these benefits they will be in a position to segment their market. Now this is a factor which really uh, underlines the importance of uh, the applicability of uh, the marketing as a composite uh, concept. Uh, if we go back to the factor of uh, desirability of uh, the marketing, uh, which is challenged and questioned by uh, the many stakeholders, I think we get the answer here. How can we proceed with the application of the marketing principles uh, in their total form and shape until uh, we understand uh, what are the segments uh, we are approaching? Because there are uh, the people uh, within the overall population or your target audience uh, who look at uh, uh, the benefit in uh, the different forms. Uh, the, for example, uh, the one segment may look at the whole thing uh, the, of uh, giving donation uh, as something um, socially acceptable and socially elevating as a matter of fact. They might think that uh, they, they improve their self-image and they get a lot of importance uh, in the society uh, by giving big donations. And in that uh, the particular instance, uh, what NPOs uh, might do um, uh, give publicity to that uh, the particular segment of the market and those individuals within that particular segment who are after the publicity and who want uh, self-importance and to get the elevation of social status. Then at the same time, there could be a segment within the target population uh, which is very submissive and uh, which uh, subscribe to uh, the religious values and men never like uh, to be publicized as the ones giving huge donations. So you deal with two different segments in two different ways by having two different marketing approaches because you are managing two different segments. So coming back to the importance of application of marketing principles in a composite form, this is the one example. And this is a challenge as a matter of fact which the marketing managers have to deal with. In Commercial marketing things are very different because consumers could generally derive one kind of benefit which is economic in nature. Uh, marketing managers at NPOs therefore have got to be very uh, conscious of uh, determining uh, the uh, kinds of uh, the benefits their um, target market uh, perceives deriving out of the exchanges it's because only in that case they'll be able to come up with accurate segmentation. 
And in order to be able to do that, they have to carry out market research. So that negates the point of uh, opponents of uh, the marketing research, which I talked about earlier as uh, one of the factors differentiating NPOs from commercial organizations. The next factor which uh, is a differentiating one is the lack of relevant information. This again uh, relates very much to the uh, necessity of uh, the marketing research in the sector of uh, the NPOs. The fact is that uh, uh, marketing research uh, within the NPO sector uh, that takes on an added importance uh, because of the fact that uh, you have to unearth and reveal uh, the social behaviors and uh, the attitudes and perceptions and preferences uh, of your uh, uh, target audience uh, in the context of uh, the social welfare and not in reference to the use of a tangible product. So uh, that really makes the job of uh, the marketing research uh, absolutely essential in the NPO sector. For every different purpose and every different mission, uh, you have to carry out research in order to reveal these attitudes and behaviors so that you can offer them better exchanges. And uh, it is possible only with the, by having relevant information, uh, which generally is lacking uh, within the sector. Um, in the commercial sector, conversely, uh, there are so many sources of uh, the laying your hands on uh, uh, information which comes to you in the form of publications and in the form of experience of the managers working for the organization in the form of a collective experience of your distributors and traders dealing with the organization and so many different factors. This is not the case with NPOs. You are working for something very highly specialized and different for which you have to carry out primary research in order to no, what is it that really takes your audience to change your behavior? And before they can change their behavior, you have to determine what is it that makes them behave in the way they do. So, therefore, the absolute need for marketing research. The problem here is that in many developing countries, carrying out research is a big challenge for managers for the reason which I cited, cited earlier. Uh, there are uh, the many respondents uh, who look upon uh, the marketing research as something presenting more problems than it solves uh, because of the thinking that uh, it is intrusion uh, into their privacy. Uh, in particular, uh, when you're dealing with uh, the people from the rural areas in the developing countries and uh, you're working on sensitive issues like uh, the family planning, immunization of their uh, the children and uh, the HIV AIDS, just to the side of few the very important world renowned NPO sector initiatives and uh, working on those uh, you run into the people who are not really willing to respond to your questions because uh, of certain values embedded into their social system it is part of the social system either not to interact with the outsiders or not to give them correct information on your uh, lifestyle, uh, your social values, uh, your habits, and your attitudes. And that is why uh, the market researchers uh, have a lot of problem with dealing with uh, these kind of respondents. There has to be an answer to this uh, the kind of a predicament. And the answer lies in making use of uh, the certain uh, the market research techniques uh, which are uh, conducive uh, for carrying out uh, this research under the kind of circumstances I just cited. One such uh, the technique is known as uh, the market-oriented ethnography. This is uh, the kind of research tool uh, which is applied in order to reveal all those factors uh, which influence um, social cultural values of a certain ethnic group. So uh, you try to reveal their habits and their uh, the social values on ethnic lines. Uh, how do you do that? A big question. You do that with the help of informants. Um, informants are the people who are part of that particular group but who are smarter, who are a little extroverted and uh, who are also uh, educated and who are reliable uh, to get you the information you are looking for. Um, therefore, uh, it is um, a very good, big task to go for the right kind of informants because in the absence of uh, them, the uh, exercise is not going to be accurate. It may still be erroneous.
The other the marketing technique that uh, the managers have at their disposal is uh, observing uh, respondents when they come to the point of uh, consumption. The point of consumption is the way the exchange takes place and uh, uh, marketing people are dealing with uh, their respondents. Their behavior and attitudes at that time reveal a lot. And uh, although uh, it is for the future reference, but nevertheless, uh, the marketing people have a lot of accurate information which is a reflection of uh, how people behave uh, while they uh, talk about their uh, uh, values and uh, their uh, uh, preferences, their uh, attitudes, uh, because at that point, they practically reflect all that. So uh, it is upon the, the marketing people, uh, rather research uh, the people to be uh, very smart at uh, analyzing the right kind of behavior which is going to arm them with the right kind of information for future reference. The next factor is the factor of reversal of attitudes and behaviors. As the terminology suggests, the basic job of the marketing people within the NPO sector is to completely reverse the attitudes and behavior of their target audience. and. Needless to say, it is a huge task I've been underlining uh, over and over again. They have to convince the people about new behaviors which they think are uh, more beneficial uh, for uh, the target audience. It is much less difficult to have your target audience uh, develop a preference for your the brand of product in relation to the competition than having all those people uh, quit their established the behaviors, change their the value systems, and give you know all those kinds of sacrifices all I talked about uh, in exchange for something which marketing people think is good for them. So, what is the equivalent of uh, this kind of a situation on the commercial side? On the commercial side, the managers come up with uh, the, all the variables of uh, the marketing mix and uh, they give a good product which is well packaged, which is uh, the very well priced and uh, widely distributed and is supported by the good promotional programs. This is how the marketing people come up with something very appealing. Conversely, on the, the NPO side, they have to bring into play the variables of marketing mix just like uh, their counterparts that they do on the commercial side, but with a lot more challenges and skill and efforts. And uh, these challenges, skill and effort could basically emanate from the kind of challenges, all the challenges that I've been talking about uh, so far. You really need to educate uh, your people, uh, first about the efficacy of a program, and then follow that with uh, a very effective uh, communication program in order to reinforce that education. Let me uh, give you one very simple example, uh, which will clarify uh, what I'm talking about. Um, if you were to uh, work on um, a program of uh, prevention of uh, ailment, uh, which could be diarrhea, uh, you first of all uh, would like to educate uh, your target audience about uh, what diarrhea is all about. You have to educate them and convince them that diarrhea uh, could be life-threatening. And in order to uh, prevent uh, this uh, ailment from uh, taking place, uh, you have to take ORT, which is oral rehydration therapy. And uh, the ORT is something which is going to take care of this problem. It is good, it is effective. And you also have to educate them about the fact that uh, in the absence of uh, the ORT, diarrhea uh, might cause death because it is life-threatening. So this is uh, the kind of uh, the program which uh, you should be coming up with uh, in relation to uh, the purpose which you are serving and the mission you are uh, following for achievement. Uh, may it be a prevention of uh, the ailment case and may that be immunization case or may that be um, conservation of energy or water a case Whatever it is, you've got to educate your target audience about the desired behavior so that they become influenceable and start taking the action which is desired of them. After having heard the whole narrative, I'm sure you will agree with me that NPOs are different from commercial organizations. And the differentiating factors basically emanate from two 
major dimensions. The one is the special purpose of the organization for which NPO exists. And uh, the second is the support mechanism which makes it uh, very important uh, for NPOs to depend on um, donors and funders. It is a lifeline for which they have to uh, seek uh, the outside support and uh, they just cannot survive or sustain themselves until the time they get the kind of requisite funding which they get from the government, international agencies and different associations, the foundations, the individuals and also from the corporate sector. So flow out of these two major dimensions, all the factors which I talked about, number one that uh, the NPOs could have uh, a donation seeking character which makes them depend upon the donors and funders and uh, that uh, really underlines the need for the managers to be very good at developing uh, relationships with uh, the board of directors and uh, the donors. And, and they should rather look at the whole thing in a very positive light and not, not negative. Uh, if they think negativity is creeping into the whole equation, they can always take up the matter in a very subtle manner where the people who are concerned, meaning the board of directors and donors. The second factor is uh, all about uh, uh, the level of scrutiny. The level of scrutiny uh, of uh, an NPO is very high because of the fact that it takes a very long time for the mission to complete um, because NPOs are not working for the profitability. They're not selling tangible products which at the time of the sales transaction uh, complete a certain process. The NPOs uh, work in a very different way and the involvement on part of the stakeholders, the meaning board members and the donors has got to be at a very high level. And that again should be taken in a positive light because it solves the more problems I personally think than it creates. And therefore again the managers have to be good at cultivating uh, board members and uh, the donors. It provides them with uh, a wonderful opportunity to have insights into uh, how donors work. Donors, as you know, are governments, governmental agencies, and uh, other uh, private sector corporations. Uh, although it is also very important for those people to have uh, a very uh, acute kind of uh, the insights into the working of the NPOs, uh, but NPOs in the first place have got to have uh, the first hand knowledge of how those people work so that they can use them to their advantage. And then there's a factor of uh, desirability of uh, the, the practice of marketing. It goes without saying that uh, we have to give marketing a very central role uh, for the reasons uh, that I gave you as part of my narrative. And the fact is that you people are uh, uh, educated enough to know what I'm talking about and the importance of uh, the putting all the variables together uh, in, to come up with uh, an effective and compatible recipe uh, can hardly be overemphasized, and you do appreciate that. I'm sure about it. Then we have the factor of for the volunteers. We have to see to it that volunteers who come to the organization are fully into, integrated into our operations, into the mainstream of things that we uh, do day in and day out. And then uh, we have uh, the uh, factor of uh, the nature of exchange and that is the, the essence of the whole marketing practice uh, within the NPO sector. Uh, we have uh, educated ourselves about the price that our target audience gives to get something in exchange and that price uh, comes to um, them in the form of different sacrifices. They sacrifice money, they sacrifice time and energy, they sacrifice um, a value system, and they may sacrifice um, um, established uh, the attitudes and behaviors. We also have uh, the educated ourselves about the fact that uh, the information we require in order to be effective with marketers is never complete, and uh, the more so is the case uh, in the NPO sector than it is uh, on the commercial side. We really have to follow the practice of the marketing research and the should come up with a set of the continuous programs which can enable us to reveal all that we need to know why people act the way they do. Because only that way we can come up with programs that will change the way they think 
and to okay, do things. And that is the ultimate objective of okay, the NPO marketing, to have the behavior um, change okay, in favor of the purpose of the organization. And then we could also have okay, educated ourselves about uh, the fact that okay, we need to educate our target audience and then uh, the reinforce the educational okay, the programs okay, with the help of uh, communication uh, to make sure that uh, the target audience okay, fully understands what we have come up with and uh, whatever we are offering uh, is going to solve the problems and is not going to create problems because we have to overcome the misperceptions and superstitions uh, to be very precise of the target audience. And in order to be able to do all that, we as managers could have to have very special and unique marketing insights into the area of nonprofit sector. Only then can we succeed as effective marketers. Thank you very much. And I look forward to talking with you again.